Face at 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. And Governor Greg Abbott now facing criticism after his latest executive order, which allows state troopers to pull over vehicles suspected of transporting migrants. While the governor says this will reduce the risk of COVID-19 exposure in our communities, those who oppose this order say it will lead to racial profiling. Our Tiffany Huertas has more on this executive order and what the negative consequences of it could look like. Governor Abbott does not have the power to unilaterally set immigration policy. State police and local police do not have the power to unilaterally pull over vehicles, to unilaterally detain people because of their immigration status. Governor Greg Abbott ordered state troopers yesterday to stop vehicles whose drivers are transporting migrants who might pose a risk of carrying COVID-19. It also gives DPS the authority to impound a vehicle that violates the executive order. Attempting Kate Huddleston, an attorney with the ACLU, already sees problems with the order. This is going to just um, cause uh, racial profiling and over policing along the border and lead to, you know, really serious constitutional problems. I think everyone's holding their breath in fear. Dani Marero he with the nonprofit La Unión del Pueblo Entero voicing similar concerns. This will absolutely lead to racial profiling. And if you think of an area like the Rio Grande Valley, where people already live in fear of how over police regions are here. Sister Norma Pimentel, the executive director for Catholic Charities of the Rio Grande Valley, says the governor's executive order will have a major impact on how they help migrants. We won't be able to take people to the hospital. We're not going to be able to take people to hotels if they're COVID positive. Pimentel says they work to keep the COVID risk low by testing migrants before they arrive at the center. We quickly separated those that were positive to take care of them by sending them to the hotels that were made available for us. She says when they test negative, they move forward to their destination and vaccines are offered. So I'm hopeful that that his actions are reconsidered. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. We reached out to the Department of Public Safety for a statement. DPS told us they are, quote, committed to securing our border under the direction of Governor Greg Abbott and through the executive orders applicable to DPS. While the department does not discuss operational specifics, we will continue to monitor the situation at the border to make real-time decisions and adjust operations as necessary, end quote. Effective immediately, max masks are now a requirement while indoors on Joint Base San Antonio. That announcement made just a couple of hours ago. This mask mandate applies to all employees and visitors regardless of vaccination status. Officials say they're also reducing building occupancy to 40% and encouraging CDC social distancing guidelines. That's not the only place putting in requirements to slow down the surge in cases. Today, Baptist Health System officials announcing they're requiring their staff to be vaccinated. Garrett Berger has more on how this decision is affecting the five Baptist hospitals in the area. Whether you're a nurse, a trainee, a doctor, or even a volunteer, Baptist Health wants you vaccinated by November 1st. But it's not a request, it's a requirement and not complying could get you fired. The CEO says they've looked at what other health organizations have done, as well as the legal environment. But what put them over the edge, he says, has been the spike in hospitalizations. There were almost five times as many COVID patients in area hospitals today as there were on average during the first week of the month. Roughly 95% of them are unvaccinated. We want to keep our staff safe uh, so that they can care for patients and they're not having to be at home in quarantine and such. We want to keep our physicians safe. And obviously we want to set the right example for the community. And while he says terminating people isn't the goal, it is a possibility. Baptist Health will allow for medical or religious exceptions, but those staff could be restricted on where they work. Stone says they already have a vaccination rate of somewhere in the mid 80s and probably higher for the actual caregivers. We also reached out to other health systems and Christus Health and University Health at least say they are not doing anything similar right now. Now on a countywide scale, nearly 77% of people have gotten at least one shot of the vaccine and more than 63% are fully vaccinated. Downtown, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. New at six, we've learned the name of the man who died after crashing into a bulldozer this morning on the far east side. SAPD identified the man as 33-year-old Jose Banda. 
The crash happened just before 6.30 a.m. at Loop 1604 and I-10 East. Witnesses told police the bulldozer was making a U-turn when Banda tried to beat the red light. Police say he did not stop in time and slammed into that bulldozer. Banda was pinned inside his vehicle before being pronounced dead there at the scene. No one else was hurt. A new specialized court docket coming to the San Antonio Municipal Courts focusing on young drivers. It's called SA Road Ready Court. City officials made the announcement today. The docket will target those ages 17 to 24 who have a ticket for driving without a valid Texas driver's license. The goal is to remove obstacles preventing them from getting their license while also providing the resources to do so. This court will hear these cases every Thursday at 1 p.m. On Capitol Hill today, Texas Democrats testifying on the voting rights bill they broke quorum to defeat more than three weeks ago. The House Oversight and Reform Civil Rights and Civil Liberties Subcommittee held the hearing today. Democrats talked about why they reject the GOP-led voting bill and what voting rights they want to see in Texas. Representative Sinfonia Thompson spoke about how she has no regrets about leaving Texas to D.C. to fight for change. I meet with anyone that they allow me to talk to them about preserving and protecting the rights of my constituents to be able to have a say in their democracy. If Democrats stay in D.C. another week, they will run out the clock on the current special session in Austin. But the governor says he'll just call another one immediately. A Texas First Lady Cecilia Abbott is fighting to end child sex trafficking online. Today she stopped by the Alamo City to push the Real Friends Don't campaign. Advocates stood outside a Real Friends Don't billboard near the Pearl area. The goal is to help parents know the signs of unsafe behavior online and to provide children with the tools to know whether someone online is real or not. Texas is already a national leader in the battle against child sex trafficking. And I have no doubt that by joining together, we can help protect all of our children. The real acronym stands for R, regular talk with your kids. E, educate yourself on their tech. A, act as if something makes you or your child uncomfortable. And L, learn more. Sad news for those planning to attend Celebrity Fan Fest. It's been canceled. Three of the headliners backed out. Ewan McGregor and Hayden Christensen, whose representatives said they are not coming because of the spike in COVID-19 cases. Owen Wilson backed out for unknown reasons. Anyone who purchased tickets, autographs, and photo ops will be refunded within 30 days. Fiesta Texas says it will still grant any Celebrity Fan Fest admission ticket holder with free access to the park from July 30th to August 8th. All right, for viewers in the northern part of our viewing area, they've been seeing some rain, Adam. Yeah, and the sky looking off to the northeast of downtown is looking rather dark, and that's because of the thunderstorms that have been pushing into town. New Braunfels, Green, all along parts of I-35 there. Uh, we're recently lit up with these showers and thunderstorms. This is looking off to the northeast. You see the clouds, and we'll most of us will see the skies darkening around San Antonio, but not all of us will get thunderstorms. You see this broken line that's been pushing into town from the northeast, basically coming along roughly the I-35 corridor. And we're seeing some spotty little downpours develop and pop up here and there, especially as the outflow boundary moves through. So the outflow boundary is going to affect temperatures as well. We'll talk about that and how much we've dropped off and where. Also increasing rain chances in the extended forecasts. That coming up. Thank you, Adam. Coming up at six, how the state is hoping more funding for road safety projects will help lower fatal crashes. And next at six, Pfizer officials pushing for booster shots. Why that is not happening just yet. Coming up. Access to the internet is no longer a luxury. It's a necessity and families living paycheck to paycheck just can't afford it on the night beat, a congressional funding bill that could help families right here in our community connect. Talk of a third dose of the Pfizer vaccine. The company says new data shows it ups protection against the Delta variant. But the U.S. Surgeon General is cautioning anyone thinking about getting a booster shot right now. 
As the Delta variant keeps spreading across the U.S., new COVID-19 cases continue to climb, a 65 percent increase over last week's seven-day average. We have hit a wall when it comes to vaccinations, and we've now seen the consequence, which is that we have surges across the country. With the Delta variant, the CDC says in rare instances, there is evidence that vaccinated people could still be contagious and may spread the virus to others. Pfizer now plans to apply for emergency use authorization of a third dose of its COVID-19 vaccine as soon as August. The company saying new data shows a booster shot strongly hikes protection against the Delta variant. At this point, I want to be very clear, people do not need to go out and get a booster shot. The U.S. Surgeon General says the government has been in talks with Pfizer about the vaccine makers' studies on boosters, but says the decision on whether to recommend a third dose will not be made by the company, but by the CDC and the FDA. Ultimately, that collective information is what will drive any decision about boosters. But right now, uh, a routine booster is not being recommended for people. While roughly a third of Americans eligible to get the vaccine still are not vaccinated, the CDC is forecasting COVID-19 cases, hospitalizations, and deaths are likely to increase over the next four weeks. In order for third doses to be administered to people in the U.S., the emergency use authorization that the FDA issued for the vaccine would either need to be amended or if the vaccine were to be fully FDA approved, a third dose could be given off label. The concerning trend continues when it comes to deaths on Texas roads. 2021 on pace for yet another increase despite efforts to reduce fatalities. Our Samuel King joins us now. Sam, the state contributing a lot of money to try to help with this issue. Yeah, Steve and Myra are about $600 million so far. That funding was committed well before the average daily rate of traffic fatalities in Texas climbed to 10.7 like it did this week. The Texas Transportation Commission's point person on safety says she's never seen a month where that average is so high. We're not headed in the right direction. Texas Transportation Commissioner Laura Ryan says she gets an update every morning on traffic safety and she doesn't like what she sees. Experts thought the higher number of traffic deaths in 2020 might have been a fluke caused by more drivers speeding on emptier roads. Well, we don't have that challenge anymore and our, our daily rate continues to climb. So I think the bad habits that were created in 2020 continue. TxDOT has dedicated at least $600 million to Vision Zero projects. Almost three quarters of that amount has already been committed to specific safety projects, some already completed, some in the planning stages. I have commitment that uh, between this month and next month, uh, all those projects will be let uh, by the end of the fiscal year. So uh, we will have all those out and then we can continue to track them and measure them. Ryan says that funding can only go so far. And I say that to bring awareness, not to state that we're not doing anything to try to continue to prevent it. But a lot of it is driver behavior. By comparison, 2020 averaged 10.6 fatalities and 20, uh, 20, uh, yeah, 2020 averaged 10.6, 2019 averaged 9.9. .9, so there was an increase and experts say the big factors in reducing crashes are controllable by drivers, less speeding, buckling up and no distracted driving. Let's take a look at traffic uh, this evening. You see some raindrops there at the Transguide camera. This is 35 at Topperwine, so some uh, rain moving into the area, so watch out for that, seeing some delays as well. This is 35 inside uh, Loop 410. Those delays improving 16 minutes now between 410 and downtown. New Braunfels, the rain moving out, but we're still seeing some major delays up there. Eight minutes, uh, eight miles per hour, excuse me, right now uh, in the New Braunfels area. Also seeing some delays in 1604 even before the construction gets underway tonight. It takes you a half hour right now to get from 281 to Bandera. So watch out for that. And also, just in the past couple of minutes, we have this new crash here. This is 410 at San Pedro heading westbound. So watch out for that. You can see uh, the crews out there and there's a bit of a slowdown on 410. So as we uh, Adam's about to tell you, some rain uh, is moving in. So if you're heading out in the next few minutes, watch out for that, guys. All right, thanks, Samuel. Let's take a look outside with Sky 12 right now. Looks like they're just getting up and going or just I think they're getting ready back. to land because you see <laughs> rain on the on the uh, lens there. So I'm guessing that means they're landing before these line of storms move through the airport area, Adam. And they're moving right near the airport 
as we speak yeah. and elsewhere as well. You can see it up over my shoulder. The sky is lit up in parts of our area. A broken line of scattered showers and thunder showers push into the southwest towards San Antonio. Take a look at the big picture and you can see really not a whole lot of activity out there, but enough to disrupt some commutes and uh, give some folks a Nice fortunate splash of rain this afternoon, especially in Kendall County, and this is just outside of Bernie now moving toward I 10. I'm going to start up there. Okay, I'm going to start in parts of the hill country here. This activity is largely driven by this outflow boundary here from previous thunderstorms closer to Austin. Now that's pushed our way and it just keeps developing and popping up new splash and dash downpours. But this is just about to cross over I 10 between Comfort and Bernie and then Bernie. It's looks like it's good. Well, right now, downtown Bernie Bergheim getting it as well. This is pushing in lightning, thunder, dark sky with it may look ominous, but nothing severe associated with that. All right. Also in parts of Bandera County, some activity uh, as well. You saw a lot more of it in New Braunfels area and Seguin, but this outflow boundary continues to kick up these little downpours scattered across Bear County now. And I'm going to pause the radar so we can look at the exact location. And most of it's right here on the north side of town, right near the airport. Churchill High School, West Avenue there. Yeah, Wurzbach Parkway near uh, McAllister Park, MacArthur High School, Wetmore Road, some downpours associated with that. And there has been a little bit of lightning and thunder associated with it as well. And even right around 1604, uh, closer to Live Oak. And we just continue to see these little pop up downpours coming and going. But this line right here, the importance of that is that's a nice cool breeze. Temperatures behind that line have dropped down to near 80 and even into the 70s because of that puff of cool wind from the pre-existing thunderstorm. So expect some of this spotty activity here and there around San Antonio through about 7 p.m. Then the sky is going to clear on out. So that's what we have going on locally, but even farther to the west of town. Yes, some more action out there, especially you get into Edwards County and Northern Valverde County. That's where we have these widely separated thunderstorms that have popped up and these are pushing to the west and southwest, likely to stay north of Del Rio. However, this outflow boundary here, this little line that you see, uh, that's likely to push toward Brackettville and Del Rio and could kickstart its own thunderstorms as it does. So a lot of what we're going to see here in the next couple of days is going to be driven by these little outflow boundaries as they move through parts of our area. Look at Braunfels 75 Canyon Lake 79 Bulverde 85 and their temperatures still dropping at the airport 85. But then you get to Castroville 94 Divine 93 Bernie your temperatures dropping as we speak. These numbers will continue to come down with that outflow boundary way out ahead of it. Near 100 in Del Rio. Look at Rock Springs. Some rain cooled air at 75. Here's the big picture, and this shows you the activity and the development over the past couple of hours north of town, and that really should only last through about an hour or so after sunset. Upper level high centered to the north of us, so that keeps the door open for little ripples in the upper level flow to move overhead. Now this is going to be shifting westward as we get into next week. The importance of that is it creates this dip in the upper level flow and that dip in the upper level flow over the eastern half of the country will pull a cold front southward and that's going to affect us. Not really much in terms of temperatures, but in terms of rain chances next week, we boost them a bit, especially by Tuesday and Wednesday. As for this evening, just through about nine o'clock, some of those spotty tea showers and a few thunderstorms, but nothing severe. Temperatures falling through the 80s, then a clearing sky. Not much of a breeze out there other than that outflow we're feeling. 75 in the morning tomorrow, mid 90s by the afternoon. That 10% chances can't rule out a pop up shower to the next couple of afternoons, but better chances of scattered activity as we get into next week, especially Tuesday, Wednesday. All right, thanks, Adam. All right, a lot of questions about Dak Prescott even before camp started. Now it's not so much his ankle. Larry, it's his right throwing shoulder and thank goodness it's not a severe injury. Yeah. Dak did practice today. He was limited though. We are live in California with more details on that and it sounds like Randall Cobb is absolutely thrilled to leave the Texans We're coming up.
Cowboys offensive line along with Zeke celebrated Dak's 28th birthday today with the cake in the face as we go camping with KSAT. Camping with KSAT, powered by Davis Law Firm. You can imagine the concern from Cowboys fans when reports indicated that quarterback Dak Prescott could miss as many as two weeks after injuring his throwing shoulder in training camp, especially after all he's been through during the last nine months recovering from that brutal ankle injury. So just how big of a setback is this? Let's go live to Cali where Greg Simmons will tell us. All right, thanks a lot, Larry. I tell you what, it depends on who you talk to, but right now, when it comes to Dak's shoulder, it doesn't seem to be a big concern either for the Cowboys or Dak himself. They're telling us just a few days down. Now, Dak was participating in the first full workout with pads on yesterday when he left the field early after experiencing pain in his throwing shoulder, something he thought he could work through after he felt a little pain the day before. Here's just part of what the Cowboys star quarterback told us as part of his one-on-one -on -one interviews. I've never taken this much time off, obviously, from the game of football either, uh, dealing with the ankle injury. So I think just getting back into it, getting back into to camp full swing, um, not taking a rep off, whether it be individuals, whether it be team reps, I think that all played a part in it. You know you can hear more from Dak Prescott and his battle back, not just from physical injuries, but mental stress as well. This Sunday night on Instant Replay after the night beat, beat the newest member of the Dallas Cowboys. He's safety Malik Hooker, who was finally able to sign this week after going through the NFL COVID protocol to get into camp and onto the field. Hooker spent his first four seasons with the Indianapolis Colts until he ruptured his Achilles tendon last year. Missed all but two games. That's just one of a host of injuries he has suffered since the Colts made him the 15th overall pick in the 2000. 17 draft. Now he's back and the Cowboys picked up the free safety to bolster their defensive backfield. I feel good right now. Right now it's just because uh, I came in, what, Friday? And you know they got the five-day protocol thing as far as the COVID situation and stuff like that. But physically right now I feel great. Uh, no setbacks as far as where I'm at in the process of recovery. Uh, things been going good. So now it's just, you know, taking my time and working back into, you know, playing football again. Because you figure I've been out for, what, a year? Going on a year now. So they're just taking their time with me and working me back into the process slowly and surely. The only question is, can he stay healthy? Live from California, Greg Simmons, KSAT 12 Sports. Thanks, Greg. Day two, training camp is in the books for the Houston Texans. And running back Phillip Lindsay says the entire team has something to prove because people think, quote, we're the scum bucket, end quote. Lindsay, who stands five foot eight and was cast off by the Broncos just two years after posting back to back thousand yard seasons, definitely has something to prove. I have a big chip on my shoulder. You know, I, I definitely did. Like, you know, for me, it's like I, I feel like I'm always being disrespected, you know, and for me, it's like, I, like I'm going to go out there and I'm going to show it. In my head, I'm the baddest dude there is, period. Houston traded slot receiver Randall Cobb back to Green Bay because that's what Aaron Rodgers wanted. And it sounds like Cobb was glad to be out of Houston and playing with a contender. I can breathe again. Uh, you know, I'm, I've, I've seen the other side. And <laughs> I'm excited to be back here. And I, I'm excited. I, I'm smiling. It's funny. My teammates say, you act like you just got out of prison. I said, well, <laughs> You know, uh, I'm, I'm very, very, very excited to be here. Cobb said Green Bay is like a Fortune 500 company and Houston is like a startup, but he did praise the path the Texans are currently on. Tonight is the NBA draft and the Spurs have picks 12 and 41. You can watch the draft live at 7 right here on KSAT 12. Interesting comments mm -hmm. from Randall Cobb. Cobb. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. All right. You have draft predictions? No, because we don't know what the Spurs right. are going to do. Always unpredictable. <laughs> we'll see tonight. <laughs> All right, uh, our case at Q&A with Dr. Ruth Bergren coming up next. It is our case at Q&A where we separate the fact from the fiction. And a big topic since we've started this segment has been COVID-19. It appears as if we're right back there again with rising cases. Dr. Ruth Bergren with the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio, an infectious disease doctor. Thank you for joining us as you have so many times, Dr. Bergeron. Uh, let's talk about where we are right now. We're seeing a surge in cases. Is this deja vu all over again for you? Yes, I wish I had better news for everybody, Steve and Myra, but um, our own hospital has seen a 66% increase in cases. Uh, that's true across San Antonio. That's just in the last week. And for some reason, we're outpacing Texas. 
So if we look at the online information that's available through the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, it shows Texas overall had a 23% rise in hospitalizations, and we here in San Antonio have had a 66% rise. And this is almost all in the unvaccinated population, Steve. So most people who overwhelmingly, the majority of people who are in the hospital right now, they have not gotten the vaccine. That's exactly right. Okay, so let's talk about for people who are vaccinated, the CDC coming out this week and saying, if you are indoors, continue to wear a mask, even if you have uh, been fully vaccinated, uh, Bear County Metro, or San Antonio Metro Health, excuse me, saying the same thing. So. Of course, there was a response from some people saying, then what was the point of the vaccine if we have to wear a mask? So explain to us, because of the Delta variant, why there was a need for the mask if you have been fully vaccinated. So first, let me say that the point of getting vaccinated was to prevent you from dying. And the vaccine will still prevent you from dying. And the point of the vaccine was to prevent you from getting severely ill to the point where you needed hospitalization or could have long haul COVID. And largely, the vaccine is still doing that. So there was always a really good point of getting vaccinated. Now, if your question is about masking it's and the changes in the recommendation, this is happening because the data are piling up that vaccinated people can get infected with Delta, they can get mildly ill with Delta, and when they are infected and either asymptomatic or mildly ill, they can easily transmit to other people. And in fact, we're seeing that in our own faculty and staff um, on the campus at UT Health. And to further your, your point, Dr. Bergeron, I mean, it's like the flu shot. The flu does not prevent, I mean, the flu shot doesn't prevent you from getting the flu. It prevents you from getting terribly sick from the flu but in a lot of instances. And it probably c prevents a lot of clinical cases of flu, but it, we know that there's breakthrough cases with the flu, and if there's breakthrough cases, they're generally mild. And so that is the point of being vaccinated, is you don't want to be one of those people that winds up in the hospital. It's still um, Go ahead. It's still a lot of questions and misinformation that is out there, and there seems like we are, are having our own surge in questions that we're getting from our viewers about the whole thing. And, and one of the questions that we got in recent days is, you look at the CDC map, the the hotspot map, and you see Bear County is considered high in the transmissibility. Then you look at the Metro Health map, and I think we have, yeah, this is the CDC map that I was talking about, Bear County in the red. You look at the Metro Health map, and it shows that we are in the moderate risk and worsening. What are the differences between these two and, you know, when should people be paying attention to all these different different maps and graphs that we see out there? Right. So I can understand the confusion about that, but that Metro Health graph is showing you an aggregate of a bunch of different variables, and it includes things like our capacity for testing, which is still really good, and it includes things like the hospital stress score, which is not off the meter. Okay, so if you consider that we're moderate, uh, we're doing really well with testing, and our hospital stress score at this moment is not terrible, um, even though our transmissibility risk is very, very high. And those things are bright red on other, in other places, if you look at the dashboard. Um, the, the aggregate of all those things comes out to moderate risk level overall to the community. But we are for sure, even on the Metro Health website, showing very bright red, critical, high risk for transmission in our community. We have heard about a handful of variants at this point. Obviously, Delta is the one that is having the biggest effect on our community and the country right now. But we've heard of other variants since Delta. So what is keeping this virus from continuing to mutate and come up with new versions of itself? Right. As long as the virus is permitted to uh, replicate to be transmitted from person to person, it will do what viruses do, which is that they're going to mutate in ways that give themselves advantages for survival and increases in infectiousness. The way to stop the virus from mutating is to stop people from getting infected. And we have two ways to stop that. 
One, get vaccinated. That's the most powerful. And the second is wear the mask. We, I, I'm going to give you 30 seconds to give just your message to the community tonight, Dr. Bergeron. Well, San Antonio, um, we want to have a flourishing and healthy community. We know how to get there. I'm going to keep this real simple. If you haven't gotten vaccinated yet, go and get vaccinated now. The hospitals are going to be stressed. We're not stressed at this moment, but we are heading in that direction based on all the numbers. What we want is a healthy, happy, flourishing San Antonio where people can do their business, go to school and have good lives. If we want that to be the case, we need to do two things. We need to get vaccinated, all of us, and we need to be willing to wear the mask, even those of us who have already been vaccinated. Dr. Ruth Bergeron with UT Health San Antonio, as always, thanks for your advice and your answers. Happy to be with you. Thank you, doctor. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. Still watching the situation on Loop 410. Had a crash there earlier. This is the view from uh, 410 at San Pedro, and you can uh, see the vehicle there directing uh, traffic away from, uh, from that scene. Hopefully that does get cleared up soon. This is where it is on the map here at Blanco's where that slowdown starts. So you can see traffic still down to about 11 miles per hour. So what's that's doing to your traffic time on the north side? 14 minutes eastbound because we also have some delays eastbound. That crash was westbound, so 10 minutes to get from 281 to I-10. So watch out for that this evening. Also up in the uh, Bernie area, looking at some uh, heavy rain in this area. So Adam's going to tell you more about that. So that's causing some slowdowns in I-10. We also have construction uh, in this area, so watch out for that, of course. Uh, but the rain is not helping matters down, so you see a lot of yellow and red in that area. People taking it easy uh, on the roads in that area. Area just like you should do uh, when you have weather like that. Other than that, we are still watching uh, some situations on the south side too. This is the 410 in St. Pedro. Uh, we showed you Topper Wine earlier on 35 when it was raining in that area. Not doing that now. Things are clear in that area. Also, some uh, closures and stuff to watch out for tonight. As always, we have that at KSAT.com. Adam will have your forecast after this break. Thought all eyes would be on the thermometer today, not just because it's Thursday, but we actually have something on the radar to be watching this evening, Adam. Yeah, we do. We have some uh, pop up, widely separated little showers and thunderstorms out there. And I do see some increasing rain chances in the days ahead. Just that activity this evening will be coming to get to an end probably an hour or so after sunset. And then a pattern shift comes on Monday and we're boosting the rain chances in that time frame as we get into next week. So let's get right to it. Here's a look at Bernie. They just had a heavy downpour move through and this right here. Look about an inch in 25 minutes from that downpour in Bernie. All right, here's a big picture of the radar over the past three hours. You can see the sky lit up a lot of lightning thunder, of course, associated with it and that broken line of showers and thunderstorms moving from the northeast to the southwest. Now it's moving through, still moving in through the Bernie area and also toward Pipe Creek, Bandera, uh, just south of Kerrville, closer to the city of Medina. But this is basically moving right along the road from Bergheim to Bernie, now into Pipe Creek, continues its trek to the southwest. It's starting to shrink a bit as well, and some of it creeping into northwestern Bear County. And we did see a little activity pop up here and there in Bear County, especially along I-35 near 1604 all the way to 410 and even close to the airport and just north of downtown. A little downpour popped up momentarily there. This outflow boundary is what's been dropping temperatures and giving you that refreshing puff of wind outside this evening and dropping the temperatures off into the low 80s. Some instances were down into the 70s, but it also developed these little pop up showers near the Calaveras Lake, basically right by the power plant there and even in, into neighboring Wilson County. Now, as that boundary continues to push to the southwest, it can still develop more showers over the next about hour and a half or so. We're also watching this activity in Edwards County. This outflow boundary in northern Kinney County that's pushing southward and already developing some action there in the northern portion of the county. And as it moves towards Brackettville, you could see a shower pop up later on. You go elsewhere. 
and really not a lot, not a lot to talk about. Just south of Pearsall, closer to Dilly, one downpour popped up briefly, and you go east of San Antonio. Nothing out there. Carnes County, DeWitt County, talking Hallettsville, Smiley, Yorktown, Quero, Goliad. Nothing on the radar in your area this afternoon. Here's the big picture. I'm going to widen it out for us. The big blue H, the upper level high, which we're so used to and accustomed to having right overhead in the summertime, still centered to the north of us. So that opens the door for some pop up thunder showers pretty much daily is what we're thinking. Just a few of them, but then increasing chances as that high moves westward into next week. So 10 to 20% chance tomorrow through Sunday. Then we start to increase those chances a little bit more, and that's because a weak cool front's going to drop in sometime between late Monday and early Wednesday and just sit here and likely de help develop some afternoon showers. Today we topped out at 95, pretty much average for this time of year. You can see the dark clouds off in the distance there, of course. 79 degrees now at the airport. You talk about the rain cool there. 79 at the airport, Bernie 73, Bulverde 77, Canyon Lake 79. But then you get to Castroville, it's 94. Though Rio Medina, Castroville, Port SA, your temperatures will momentarily be dropping with that outflow boundary. Rock Springs, good example right now at 77, but Del Rio at 99. So we'll, those of you that haven't cooled down yet will be falling through the 80s gradually by 10 o'clock, mid 80s, midnight, closer to 80 degrees. And those thunder showers really losing their luster, especially after sunset, so a little closer to 9, 930. Tomorrow, that 10 to 20% chance will start the day in the mid 70s then top out at 95 for the afternoon high temperature. And as I mentioned into next week, we're increasing those rain chances and we will have to fine tune those temperatures as well. If we boost those rain chances even more and start to hone in on the most likely day next week of more numerous showers, then we could even drop those temperatures more than what you see there. How about that? <sighs> I had to give you an update. Okay. So I don't show up to any old fishing tournament and fishing challenge empty handed. <laughs> you wear your fishing costume. <laughs> shirt, you mean, <laughs> costume, That was shirt. my bad. I called it a fishing costume once. Once. Well, One time. I also show up with a thermometer to compete for, <laughs> right? And we caught some good fish, right? We had some nice fish that were caught. Look at that. Good job, Bill. Good job there. But we all colluded behind his back to have Marty Blue to be the winner because he was the big organizer and brought everything together. He didn't fish as well as the rest of us, no offense, Marty, but he looked good doing it with those shirts, team shirts, sponsored by Thermometer Thursday. And we surprised him at the very end and he got to take the thermometer home. And now we finally have there you go. a homemade thermometer hanging in Hallettsville. So every time he goes in and out of his awesome shop, he gets to check the old accurate thermometer for the <laughs> accurate reading of the temperature. All right, let's get a look at our winner for this week. Today's homemade thermometer winner, Nancy Gonzalez of San Antonio. The Nancy Gonzalez I will be emailing here in a couple of minutes. You can go to ksat.com slash thermometer to enter the drawing. I also noticed with those uh, outfits, as I'll call them, <laughs> You had like a little holster or holder here for some sort of beverage and your friends had holsters here for some sort of beverage. I'm just, I mean, that's just what I noticed from. Some sort of beverage. I some sort of beverage. Fully you gotta, equipped. You got to stay hydrated, right? <laughs> I could live for three days off of what I have in that fishing vest. There, I have no doubt. <laughs> right, that's, yeah, that makes total it, sense. It's like 75 pounds. <laughs> in case you missed it, coming up next. It is Thursday. It is July 29th. Today, Joint Base San Antonio updating its COVID-19 protocols. Effective immediately, JBSA requiring everyone to wear a mask in indoor settings in installations regardless of vaccination status. The area hospitals hit a high of 1,520 hospitalized COVID-19 patients. Today, it's less than half that. 695, but it's still enough to cause stress on hospitals, already handling pent up demand for non COVID issues. Being Democrats from Texas on Capitol Hill delivering their case today at a hearing over voting legislation. State Representative Diego Bernal, one of several state reps, is speaking about why they're in D.C. to begin with. Part of his remarks regarding partisan poll watchers. Bernal says under the proposed law, poll watchers would be able to, quote, 
break the election code or the penal code, and the only thing an election judge could do is give them a warning, end quote. And a woman escaped a rollover crash unharmed overnight. San Antonio police say she crashed into the barrels on the entrance ramp of Highway 281 near Bitters Road. Her vehicle flipped, but she wasn't hurt. She told investigators she was texting before she crashed. A 17-year-old is in the hospital and facing charges tonight. San Antonio police say he was shot during a home invasion last night. According to police, around 11 last night, the teen and another person kicked in the door of the home in the 200 block of San Ignacio. But before getting into the home, they got into a shootout with someone inside. Shortly after, the teen showed up at a downtown hospital. And at last check, he was in critical, critical condition. <laughs>Tomorrow will start the day in the 70s and then make it into the mid 90s for most of us, but closer to 100 along the Rio Grande as usual. Timberwood Park 92, Helotus 93, Lavernia 94 for the high tomorrow. All right, thanks, Adam. And thanks for watching the news at 6. We'll see you tonight on the night beat at 10 or whenever the NBA draft is.